This is part two of two in this video series on the medical history and physical. In this part, I'll be presenting an HMP using the format and principles that were discussed in part one. Remember that the purpose of the oral presentation is to convey information to colleagues rapidly in order to aid real-time decision making. Therefore, it will be necessary to be briefer than the written HMP would be for the same patient, but all of the same structural components should still be present. As I mentioned among the final tips from the last video, unless explicitly instructed otherwise, you should keep your oral presentation to five to seven minutes in length. This can be very challenging, particularly for patients with complicated medical histories or those with long differential diagnoses. However, as anyone who is rounded in the hospital has likely observed, there never seems to be adequate time to accomplish what needs to be accomplished. Things are almost always falling behind schedule and even when they aren't, all it takes is one unanticipated emergency, sick colleague, or upset patient, and your team will end up behind schedule very quickly. So it really is critically important to keep your presentations within these time bounds. If the listener wants more information, he or she can ask you for it or can refer to your more uh, detailed written note. One seemingly simple but guaranteed helpful recommendation in order to keep your presentations under seven minutes is to speak quickly. You should be speaking slightly faster than you would in normal conversation or if you were giving a lecture to a room full of students. But don't overdo it. If you find yourself running out of breath while presenting, that's probably too fast. Given the speed of the presentation, some of the annotations in this video uh, on the side may seem like they're quickly flying by. I encourage you to make liberal use of the pause button. The source of information is the patient, Mrs. Jones, with additional info provided by her husband. Both appear reliable. The chief complaint, Mrs. Jones is an 80-year-old woman presenting with two episodes of syncope over the past week. Mrs. Jones reports being in her usual state of health until four weeks ago, at which time she noted the onset of occasional lightheadedness. These episodes usually occurred while walking, lasted for a few minutes at a time, and spontaneously resolved upon sitting down. They initially occurred about once every two to three days. There were no associated symptoms, including chest pain, shortness of breath, or palpitations. Over the next three weeks, they became more frequent, eventually occurring several times a day. One week ago, she stood up from the dinner table to walk across the kitchen, suddenly felt lightheaded for a few seconds, and passed out. She woke on the ground several seconds later, where she stayed for another minute while her lightheadedness passed. She then got up and rested in a chair for another five minutes before feeling completely back to normal. She denies hitting her head at that time. The event was witnessed by her husband, who reported no jerking motions of the arms or legs, no incontinence, and no significant confusion after she woke. Her husband wanted to bring her to the ER, but she declined because she was afraid of being admitted to the hospital. Since then, she has continued to experience intermittent lightheadedness, continuing to become more frequent until a recurrent episode of passing out on the day of admission that was identical to the first. Her husband called 911 and paramedics then brought her to the hospital. Mrs. Jones currently reports feeling fine and is asking to go home. When asked what she thinks might be causing her symptoms, she states that she should be staying better hydrated. For her past medical history, Mrs. Jones had an MI in 2010, but has had no history of heart failure. She also has had diabetes for 20 years, with a recent hemoglobin A1C of 8.5%, diabetic peripheral neuropathy, and osteoarthritis. Her surgical history includes only an appendectomy 40 years ago. She has no significant gynecologic or psychiatric history. Medications include aspirin, metoprolol, lisinopril, simvastatin, metformin, and amitriptyline, uh, the last of which she was recently started on for her neuropathy. She takes no herbals or supplements, and she reports 100% adherence to all medication. She has had no adverse drug reactions. For her social history, she is a non-smoker and drinks one to two glasses of wine per night. She denies any history of illicit drug use. She currently lives in downtown Palo Alto in a single family home with her husband. Her family history is non-contributory. Review of systems was negative aside from what was covered in the HPI. 
On exam, she is a well-nourished elderly woman who appears her state of age and is in no apparent discomfort. Temperature is 98.4, heart rate 58, supine blood pressure 134 over 70, which decreases to 110 over 65 upon standing, respiratory rate 14 and O2 sat of 96% on room air. She has no carotid bruise. Her cardiac exam reveals a normal sinus rhythm, normal S1 and S2, two out of six early systolic murmur at both upper sternal borders without radiation, no S3 or S4. Her JVP is about six centimeters. Pulmonary, abdominal, extremity, and skin exams are all normal. A thorough neuro exam was unremarkable, with the exception of diminished sensation to light touch throughout both feet, along with absent ankle reflexes bilaterally. Her gait is slow, but without other abnormalities. Labs demonstrate an unremarkable CBC and complete metabolic panel. BNP is 220, and a troponin is less than 0.07. A UA shows only one plus protein. Chest x-ray demonstrates mild cardiomegaly and probable osteopenia. An EKG reveals non-respiratory sinus arrhythmia with a rate of 56 and first degree AV block with a PR interval of about 250 milliseconds. She has Q waves in 2, 3, and AVF and has evidence of LVH by voltage criteria. So in summary, Mrs. Jones is an 80-year-old woman with a past medical history of MI and diabetes who presents with subacute progressive positional lightheadedness culminating in two recent episodes of syncope. Her exam is notable for mild orthostatic hypotension, an early systolic murmur, unremarkable labs, and an EKG with evidence of mild conduction system disease. Problem number one is her lightheadedness and syncope. Given the combination of her orthostasis by history and exam and recent medication change, orthostatic hypotension secondary to amitriptyline is the most likely diagnosis, particularly as this is one of the most frequently observed meds to cause this problem. Closely related to this possibility is the chance that she may have autonomic dysfunction from diabetes as the presence of neuropathy suggests her diabetes has been long-standing and not optimally controlled. Less likely, but still an important consideration, is a bradyarrhythmia, such as severe sinus bradycardia, or intermittent high-degree AV block. Her EKG suggests the presence of conduction system disease, and bradyarrhythmias are a relatively common cause of syncope in the elderly. However, this is not typically positional, as she describes her symptoms. A don't-miss diagnosis for Mrs. Jones is ventricular tachycardia, which she is at risk for given her prior MI, but otherwise, nothing else is suggestive of this diagnosis. Her heart murmur is consistent with aortic stenosis, though the murmur's character is not consistent with the severity of AS that would be necessary to cause syncope. The diagnostic plan for her syncope includes telemetry monitor for 24 hours, followed by a two-week ambulatory monitor if the diagnosis remains unclear at discharge. She will receive an echo to rule out aortic stenosis. And as something which spans both the diagnostic and therapeutic domains, we will DC her amitriptyline and monitor for resolution of the orthostasis over the next several weeks as an outpatient. For education, we will instruct Mrs. Jones to always move from a lying to standing position over the course of several minutes. Problem number two is her CAD, for which we will continue all of her previous cardiac meds. In the event that her telemetry picks up more significant bradycardia, we will need to discuss the risk-benefit ratio of discontinuing the metoprolol. Problem number three is her diabetes as she will likely be eating normally, and we do not anticipate any upcoming contrast studies, we will continue her outpatient metformin. For her neuropathy, as stated above, we are discontinuing the amitriptyline. To avoid confounding her presentation, we will hold off on adding any new meds for now, but would consider gabapentin at some point in the future. For diet, she will be on a standard carb-controlled diet. For prophylaxis, we are encouraging ambulation and will start sub-Q heparin. And finally, her primary stated goal of care is to get home as quickly as possible, preferably with her lightheadedness resolved. She clearly states that in the event of a cardiac arrest, uh, she would not want to receive attempts at resuscitation and would be strongly opposed to an ICU admission. As such, we have placed a DNR DNI order in her chart. So that's my example of a typical HMP oral presentation. You should not expect to be able to present a case this fluidly and efficiently when starting out or even after months on awards as a clinical student. This is essentially what you should be striving to achieve by the end of your intern year, which is the first year after completion of medical school for anyone viewing this video from a country with a different structure to medical training. I hope you found this annotated demonstration helpful. Concurrent with practicing your presentation skills, you should also be working on your clinical reasoning skills that is how to generate the differential diagnosis that you will discuss in the oral presentation. 
you may find my three-part video series on that skill helpful as well.